Welcome to the Inside Bassmaster Podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, episode 118, and it is Bassmaster Classic Week, Kyle Jesse. Uh, I'm your host, as usual, Ronnie Moore, my co-host uh, for every one of these podcasts, Kyle Jesse in Birmingham, the digital content editor of everything that touches Bassmaster.com, and kind of one of the guys that's important on leading that charge for classic content leading up to the event, helps with fantasy fishing buckets, uh, does all the stories. I mean, he's on top of it, and it is finally Classic Week, Kyle. I'm kind of a little worn out. It's a little hectic leading into it, but this is the time to recharge the batteries and get full-blown exhausted with how hard we try to work this week to make it make it the biggest show um, in the industry. No question. Yeah, it is absolutely nice having, uh, you know, in the case of this year, having a couple weeks with no tournaments because it is content overload on Bassmaster.com with uh, classic content. Like you said, fantasy fishing content, it's all out there um, and it takes a lot of work to get all that done. So uh, big credit to everybody in the digital department for, you know, knocking that out. And then obviously, you know, you guys at JM knocking out the video content. So um, yeah, no, I mean, this is time of year for me, at least where I can't get the theme song out of my head that da, 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 da. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is this is it man this is the freaking classic this is what we look forward to um all year long um you know as bass fishing fans as um you know employees of bass and then obviously the anglers this is what they work their whole careers for um this is you know as overblown as is it as it is and uh cliches it is it truly is the super bowl of bass fishing like you watch the super bowl just a few months ago and you think to yourself like this you know we have our version of that and that's the classic and it always has been and it always will be so um obviously a lot of excitement for this year's classic and uh i think that everybody that went to the 2019 classic in knoxville knows how special that was and how awesome of a venue and a fishery and everything about that classic was. So uh, I am certainly looking forward to get back to Knoxville. And I know that there are plenty of other people that are looking forward to get back as well. Yeah. I'm not musically inclined at all, but if I did learn an instrument, it would have to be a trumpet just so I can learn, you know, for the Bassmaster regal music. But um, yeah, if, if you're just joining the podcast for the first time, or maybe you're an avid listener or viewer on, on the website or on YouTube, um, use, you can check out this QR code. Uh, our partners at Black Rifle Coffee Company, BLASTOFF25 is the promo code if you want to get any kind of purchases or maybe get with the coffee club. Um, if you're a big coffee drinker, be able to have that to your disposal every month. Uh, those those fine folks have provided that QR code and the discount code to be able to get in on that action. But yeah, Kyle, the uh, I have to admit, I might get egged when I get to the classic because I am not a fan of the Tennessee Volunteers. And I let everyone know on Twitter. So if anybody in, in Knoxville follows me on Twitter, I'm probably going to get egged. But I do know that they love their sports. They're competitive. And boy, if the Volunteers can have another one up on Clemson after beating them in the bowl game like they did, if Tennessee can retake the classic record for attendance over Hartwell, which is Clemson based, you know, city and lake, I think that they're going to take the advantage to try to do that. They got one up and they want to re one up them, but it's the Bassmaster Classic. Uh, I've got 50 messages from people saying, Hey, I'm going to be at the Classic. Are you guys going to be there? And that's the one event all year where we pick up the, the studio in Little Rock and we put it, we set it on some, uh, some semi trucks and we bring it all the way over to East Tennessee for the classic and we drop it right in the convention center. So if you're a fan of Bassmaster Live, stop on by and and check out the setup there. Mark Zona, Tommy Sanders, Davey Hype, Dave Mercer, uh, myself, Such will all be there uh, along with the other fine folks that make it happen. Like you said, you'll be on the water taking photos, but man, there's always, it's uh, always a great time at the convention center for the expo. It's always popping. And then the weigh-ins. Having it at Thompson Bowling Arena, I'm honestly, I think that they host like a round one matchup. It's a site maybe for the March Madness. And they're like tearing On down. Yeah, mon- like we're delayed a day because they're tearing down um, the arena today as the podcast airs after the game so that Tuesday we can move in and get the whole scene set up for the pull through weigh-ins that we're going to have at Thompson bowling arena, which should be super cool. Um, it's awesome. March madness is in full effect. And to have the classic kind of right in the middle of it 
is uh, is great for us. Um, I do know that if Arkansas advances and Alabama or Auburn advances, like a lot of the people there are going to be looking at their phones throughout the day to check the scores. But Kyle, the uh, the fishing should be great. Um, I think that we're going to get a mix of 2019 and a mix of 2021 with a little bit new as well. Um, I'm excited to see that combo. And today's guest on the podcast is none other than Matt Robertson, um, a guy who I guess made his debut to the world. You know, he had had some, some success leading up to this, but the Bassmaster Classic in 2019 was the big unveiling of the fur coat and the water splash and and just Matt Robertson's personality on full effect. And now we see it a few years later, and he's a um, one of the names to consider now in the top 15 in AOI every year, it seems. Yeah, no question. I mean, a Tennessee River guy obviously cut his teeth fishing way up the Tennessee River, obviously closer to Kentucky Lake, that that area of the Tennessee River, but, uh, you know, has had some success there at, at the Tennessee River pool. Obviously, had fished uh, two events there back in 2021. I want to say he had a really good finish. Don't have it off the top of my head, but top 20 finish, I believe. So, um, you know, obviously things have come full circle for, uh, for Matt since his, you know, coming out party, as you mentioned back in 2019, but certainly looking forward to uh, getting his thoughts in the upcoming classic. I feel like we see him at every single elite event and even some open sprinkled in, and then he's active on social media, but I feel like the Bassmaster classic every year is his coming out party. Like we know him, but we just don't know much about him this year. Cause we don't know what he's going to do or what's going to happen, but um, glad Matt Robertson's going to join us. We're also going to have later, and you can explain this a little bit, Kyle, uh, in the podcast, our last guest after our fantasy picks will be Brian Brasher, one of the magazine editors for not only Bass Times, but also contributes with Bassmaster, uh, Bassmaster Magazine. Also, you know, I think his column also goes on Bassmaster.com at times too. Um, and he's going to break down something that we kind of debate about, you know, in text or we're, we speculate about off the record um and, and that is the odds that we set for anglers with their chance to win the classic Kyle. yeah absolutely that's obviously one of the more popular photo galleries on bassmaster.com throughout the entire year um and I, i'm really looking forward to getting brian's thoughts on it because brian is you know his name is on the the classic odds gallery granted that's kind of a discussion that we have amongst a handful of people uh, but at the end of the day, Brian's the one that gets all the negativity thrown towards him for not having, uh, you know, this guy higher or my, you know, significant other higher than, than you know, this guy or whatever. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear from Brian, get his take on it. I know he's he's looking to clear the air there, of course, but uh, there's no question that is one of the most popular photo galleries that goes up all year long. And it's interesting to see. Um, and I, I love hearing the angler's reaction because, uh, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, all that does for most of them is put a chip on their shoulder. So um, it is I am certainly looking forward to uh, hearing what Brian has to say more about the odds gallery. Now, I'll say that uh, most of the time when I turn on the Internet, it's to be entertained. I'm going to read something that I like. I'm going to look at something. I'm going to watch a video. I'm going to do whatever. And I feel like the Elite Series anglers hear that there's a gallery out there about the odds and they're like, how can I get a chip on my shoulder today? And then they go on to Bassmaster.com and look through it. And they're like, oh, 75 to one, huh? Well, my mom loves me. So screw you, you know, but <laughs> first up on the docket is uh, is our guy, Matt Robertson, though. And I I'm excited uh, to get to talk to him. Kyle, our guest today, as promised, Matt Robertson on him. Everybody knows this guy. And actually, it's interesting that we have him as the guest to preview this we talked about it previously, but he is one of nine anglers, Kyle, to fish both the Elite and the Classic on the Tennessee River out of Knoxville. So we've seen it both types of uh, fishing conditions. And also, this was really the introduction to the fur coat, the water smashing, was Knoxville, Tennessee. So, Kyle, I'm glad we got Matt. Matt, how are you today? I see you're en route to it. Uh, this is obviously shot before practice starts. Yeah, man, uh, I'm excited for it. And, uh, yeah, we're headed to Knoxville. Knoxville right now, and yeah, we uh we might have to pull out some uh a new fur coat this event. <laughs> yeah, well, Matt, <laughs> go ahead, Kyle. Go ahead, no, go ahead, Ronnie. Go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say I don't really know how each year you can top yourself, or <laughs> if you have to just kind of do an Aaron Rodgers thing and go into like five days of solitude in a dark room to figure out the next idea. But I can't, I can't wait to see what it is. 
as long as it doesn't get Matt in trouble. We don't we don't want Matt in trouble anymore. We want Matt happy and Matt fishing well. And so <laughs> that's the deal. Yeah, Matt's not getting in trouble anymore. So <laughs> we're good. We're good. Um, I got to tell you, though, like, I'm more excited about the shoes than I am the fur coat. So, yeah, buddy, I'm talking about some straight up pimp stuff. Good. I like it. I like it. You see this? The listen, we just got to get it out front, right, get out ahead of it. The the thing everybody's been wondering: Does Matt have a date tonight at championship? <laughs> this is what everybody's I asking. Do, I do have a date. I did not pick her, and although I do like her, I like her. <laughs> Like, it's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time. She's going to look good. And uh, the boys picked her. Like, yeah. The boy, Chris, Corey, and Seth, all unanimous, unanimously picked her out of everybody. And I probably, I ain't going to lie, I probably had about 100 dudes message me want to go. But, <laughs> I mean, I got some dandy pictures, buddy. I got some guys in a, you know, all kinds of stuff. But it was, it was pretty comical. And, uh. But yeah, um, I can't I can't tell who it is. She wants to surprise the world. So, and I know you guys. I you guys know her. I, a lot of people know know her in the industry. And yeah, it's going to be a good surprise. Well, Kyle, on that topic, let's just say there's a girl angler that is fishing the opens this year. And about the same day Matt posted the inquiry about sending in your stuff, she posted, does anyone know where I can get a nice dress for the classic? And I was like, ain't no way he decided that quick. I know that he's got to let those ballots come in. So uh, she confirmed that she was not the chosen one uh, and that it was for something else. But okay. <laughs> Matt on the, on the water, um, this is the Bassmaster Classic, man. You're fun in games, yep. but at the end of the day, you know, you can put the fur coat on, you can sit on your throne, have all your trophies around you, but deep in your heart of hearts, you are a, a, a bass angler that just wants to strive for greatness. This means a lot to you, and you've done it through the team championship route. You've done it through the Opens winning one route, not far from where we're going to be, and you've done it through the Elite Series points. You're probably one of a handful of people to do it those three routes. You might actually be the only yep. one from the team and nation, but doing it multiple ways, what does it mean to you just to be able to fish in this classic and and not take it for granted, but but really prepare yourself to try to win? Oh, yeah, man. It's, uh, you know, fishing the classics, everything. I want that trophy more than you can imagine and uh yeah dude like going into this it uh you know i grew up fishing the tennessee river just the complete opposite end of it um there's not as much offshore fishing there as it is here except for the smallmouth that's more of a east tennessee style fishing but uh dude it sets up the way i grew up fishing and and i'm kind of torn on going for the small mouth or the large mouth i'm going to dabble with both but kind of just let my gut tell me which way to go but man i you i grew up uh banging on some shallow large mouth just like on the tennessee river and and man that's you know as as good as a deep water angler that i feel like i am uh, i'm almost scratching the small mouth i'm just gonna go i may just go bang with large mouth all week and that's something I was going to bring up as well. I mean, you look at yourself and your career, um, you know, you've had success on so many of the Tennessee River lakes, and it seems like there's a, a lot of you guys that have success regardless which pool of the Tennessee River you're fishing. Like, are there things that you take from, you know, fishing Kentucky Lake and, and fishing different, you know, areas of the Tennessee River that you can kind of apply everywhere? Do you all treat them a little different? No, man, it, it does. Like, like each each body of water has its similarities but it also has its differences. And uh, the, the like the only difference between Kentucky Lake, like whenever I was younger growing up fishing, uh, cutting my teeth, you know, fishing channel banks, throwing little, you know, little square bills and whatnot, spinner baits, jerk baits, like that's how I cut my teeth fishing and in the spring. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing in Knoxville. And, uh, you know, a couple other lakes here, smaller, smaller lakes here, fish just like that. And uh, actually, Seth uh, Seth Fighter just got come down for the past three or four days. And, yeah, but dude, we just got done. Like, we banged on him. We had a fun couple of days. Like, and uh, we both had over 22-something. And then yesterday, we went on Kentucky Lake and banged out 27 and a half. You know, like, we, uh, 
Yeah, we've been we've been prepping up, sharpening the skills, the style fishing we're gonna fish, and and yeah, I think we got everything dialed, and we're gonna be we're gonna do our whole life, you know. That's all. Well, I I I think Matt, it's kind of interesting how the elite anglers approach the classic because. When you think about it, the only other place where you guys get to an event early and fish a lake nearby to kind of get your, you know, bearings is the first event of the season. Guys will go down to Florida, fish a lake that's around there for a few days before getting going. You guys are all, you know, in tune. You're already ready. But why why do you feel it's so important to fish something similar right before the classic, even though it's a totally different body of water? Just, I guess, to to take that Florida stuff out of the boat, out of your mind and, and do that. It's it's unlike any other prep for a tournament that we've seen. Yeah, you know, it's like any other sport. You know, you're gonna you're gonna practice, you're gonna brush up, you're gonna get in tune. And uh, you know, you wanna go out there like we're gonna be doing a lot of cranking, maybe some fit jig fishing and uh and spinner bait and stuff like that, jerk bait. We're gonna go out there and we're gonna use the rod and reels, we're gonna use the line, the hooks, make sure we're not losing a lot of fish or anything like that's happening. And uh, if we are losing some fish, maybe adjust for and stuff like that, you know, it's just all the little fine tuning we're going to take care of before we actually get out there to ensure that, you know, we don't lose any fish that we need in the boat. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let's talk a little bit about the conditions, like the forecast. Obviously, I know everybody's keeping an eye on that. You know, you had all this warm weather for the last few weeks. And then, you know, it's obviously getting a little colder now and looks like it's going to be that way maybe during the tournament with some adverse weather. Um, just your thoughts without, you know, obviously giving too much away just on the conditions and how that might change the tournament itself. Um, it's not going to change large. It's, it's not going to change the large mouth fish and those large mouth on, on that end of the Tennessee river. That's a, it's a river fishery. Um, they're going to be shallow. They live shallow, you know, seven foot or less. You're not going to see no big school largemouth caught deep. Um, the only thing that it will affect is the smallmouth. And, you know, before whenever it was warming up, I thought they'd have pushed up a little shallower, scattered. But with this, uh, with this cool weather, like, I don't think the fish were far enough along um, and pushing up because of the warm weather. I think you're going to see uh see some guys really crack the smallmouth you know um someone like gussie or uh dude i actually look for uh old cooper to have a real good tournament and uh and you know because i know he's going to go out there and try to catch those smallmouth that's what he's good at and like those guys are going to commit to that and yeah man i think i think because of the colder weather you're going to see the smallmouth play a little bit more than they normally would have um, uh, you know, we're quite a bit, we're like three weeks or a month behind from whenever we was there last time, but nonetheless, this cool weather is going to keep them in that winter and winter and pattern, you know, for sure. You, you've been there two previous times, once when it was the classic in Feb or, you know, in early March, yep. and then we had the elite in February. Uh, if I went to Fort Loud and Teleco right now, and you said, you got to go catch a smallmouth, I'm going to the, to the cut through between the lakes, because that's the only place we have seen a more than one smallmouth get caught in a row. Are the, did you, yeah. have you fished in Teleco enough to know the smallmouth game? Are there enough smallmouth straight up on Fort Loudon on the main drag that, that you can specifically target them? Or is it going to have to be a gussy type deal in that, you know, you're going to have to get in that long deal and look for the boulders. Cause I feel like if you caught some of those main river current smallmouth, they're good. You could probably get some tanks out of there. Whereas some of the ones, you know, maybe in the cut through are more like rails, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, I'm not for sure about Fort Loud. And I would honestly think that, you know, some of it's a little dirtier fishery, although it's not always dirty. I would think that they're predominantly uh, up for within, you know, exception of a couple miles of the dam. I would think that those smallmouth, uh, live a little shallower uh, versus out deep in those schools like that. But Teleco, it's a deep, clear fishery. And I'm telling you, like, there is, without a shadow of a doubt, you know, a school of smallmouth somewhere up that lake. I mean, and somebody's probably going to find them, one of the few guys that commit to it. I mean, that, that's what I think, because it's a deep, clear fishery, and there's plenty of, you know, they're out there living somewhere. That that one part of the lake isn't the only part holding those smallmouth. 
Let's talk a little bit about weight predictions. Uh, you know, normally we we talk about winning weight, cut weight. I don't know if you've even given any thought to the cut weight, but what do you what do you think the winning weight? Uh, you know, prediction. Uh, excuse me, prediction is going to be. Uh, winning weight. I'm going to go with like. Uh... I'd probably go 52, 53 pounds. You know, I know it's. I know last time we was there, I think maybe one twenty pound bag and an eighteen pound bag was the biggest. But like I said, I think so. And the reason I think the weights are going to go up a little bit is because one, you're going to have smallmouth playing a little more because Gussie figured out the Demiku rig last time. But then that's also going to, you know, you're going to have more guys fishing for those little bigger smallmouth. But then you're not thinking that there's going to be less pressure on the largemouth areas. So that's so the guys who do stick with largemouth fishing may catch a little better bags, you know. Sure. Matt, we we classified you and we kind of found out who you were and where you were from and you busted on the scene. I mean, you you've won an open in East Tennessee. You did so well in the team championship down in Florida. Um, your home is on in West Tennessee, you know, Kentucky region, that that part of the Tennessee River. But Last year, we got to see a different Matt Robertson, and you caught them all over. A top 10 in Angler of the Year. You're not you're not just the funny guy everyone looks to get a laugh out of. Like, you know, they would – like Gerald Swindle. You know, everybody wants a laugh out of him. Yeah. But if you just listen, he's a really smart angler, really well, well-versed and can do it everywhere. Are you turning into that, or, you've, or have you been that, and now we're finally seeing it consistently throughout a whole season? No, I think I've been that, and, uh, of course, I've, you know, I think I've fine-tuned a few things, but I've been a pretty diverse angler. I grew up, like, a lot of people think about me as just, you know, a Tennessee River guy, but that's one thing that separates myself from a lot of the Tennessee River guys is, man, I grew up on a couple other lakes, an actual, you know, like, like a Ohio River-style fishery uh, river, and, man, I can, I can go up shallow, and I can bang on them doing that stuff, swim jigging. Um, but no, man, I think, I think what you saw happened and we had a little bit of rough start to the year this year, but I feel like that's, that's Florida for me. You know, I about just same draw names out of a hat as to fish tournament down there, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, had a couple of rough ones in Florida, but we're out of it fishing the classic and fishing for at number one, you know, and, and you know, I'm I'm really pumped to get out there and get after it. Kyle, I wanted to follow up on that. You were talking about fishing for number one. How hard is it to go from being Mr. Consistent or at least wanting to get good points to start the season to now mindset is it doesn't matter if you're second through the rest. Obviously, you want the payouts of second through 10th or whatever, but fishing for first, not, not necessarily worrying about punting, but yep. you got to make the top 25 to fish Sunday. If you're in the oh, top yeah. 15 – it's still a ball game you can probably win because of how volatile this fishery yeah. is. So at what point does Matt realize, Hey, I need to survive the last three hours of today so I can still keep swinging for one tomorrow. Cause if I don't and I die, then, you know, then, then number one's out of shot range anyways. No, you're right. Like um, you do got to be there on day three, but like you still got to be there on day one too. So we're gonna go for it, and if we don't catch nothing on day one, then that's all right. <clears throat> it uh, it, it's not it's not really hard for me to get in that mindset. I fish like that a lot of one day derbs, two day, three day derbs. You know, coming growing up and in years past, and um, like you're to win this, you're gonna have to fish your strengths and everything, and so that's what we're going out there to do. Um, if we're not there after day one, that's all right. We're gonna we'll go out day two and chuck at her again try to catch a real big bag and then if not we'll be having a good night saturday night one thing you kind of mentioned and i'm almost i'm almost hesitant to ask this because i don't want you to give too much away but it's obviously been a place where we've seen big baits play and that's something that you're obviously really good at and you do a lot uh do you think you know it being later in the year uh naturally you know most people would, you know look at it as a better time to fish that that will get better, worse, pretty much the same. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> I think the big, ba bigger baits could play a little more there this time. The only like, like the water temperature set up for a, a bigger bait to play. Like it's setting it. 
If it was a, it was in a, if the water temperature is in the mid fifties, which I don't think it will be, I think it'll be forty eight to fifty two, depending, uh, depending on these cool nights. But like it's setting up for a big bait to play. It most definitely is. Matt, how are you going to approach practice? Uh, I discussed this with Jason Christie and Chris Zaldane just a, a few days ago. Uh, how are you going to practice? Because doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday practice, having a few days off, doing Wednesday final practice, and then you touch the water yeah. for day one on Friday. What's what's day one? Is that a run around on Friday and look around the lake, see the water temps in different places? Is it a try to get on some fish? And then what does Wednesday no. entail for you, you know, the final day when you're when you're wrapping it up? I'm going to uh, the first day I'm going to go try to figure out some smallmouth stuff and give it, you know, a legit chance. And then depending on how that goes on, on the first day of practice, then, then I'm going to, I'll probably smallmouth fish one day and I'll just go large mouth fish another three. And uh, I got a few little ace in the holes i like to call them from the last couple of times i've been there caught a couple of big bags but i can't do it uh by practicing and catching them so we're gonna also wing it a little bit so we might just go fish stuff we didn't even fish in practice <laughs> and you know this is something ronnie brought up um you know earlier but i'm, I'm just curious you know obviously 2019 like ronnie mentioned was such a coming out party like Everybody, you know, knew who Matt Robertson was from that time on. And it seems yeah. like in such a short amount of time, like you've gained as much name recognition as any angler in the sport has in such a short amount of time. I just, I'm curious, like, what has that journey been like for you? Because it, it's really not been that long in terms of years, but like, it seems like you've been doing this forever now. No, yeah, man. I honestly, you want to know the truth? I don't pay much attention to it. Um, it's... uh uh, it is kind of wild how how I guess the popularity's grown over the years, but um, yeah, like you said, it's been a short period of time, and I just think I'm uh I'm think I'm I'm somebody somebody you know a lot of regular people can relate to, and I think they appreciate that knowing you know someone like them's fishing, and dude, like it's I honestly don't think about it much because I still don't. I just think of myself as a regular guy like everybody else, you know. I think we made a rule back in 2000 or 99 or whatever it might have been, Kyle, and said if we put a mic in front of a redneck, we better watch out because they could be famous real quick. And we did that with Gerald Swindle, and we didn't learn from that. And we put a, we put a mic in front of Matt Robertson, and that same thing's happened. But, um, Matt, I got one more thing to uh, before I let you go, unless Kyle's yeah. got another thing. We saw forward-facing sonar. It's here to stay. We see how it changes tournament fishing at times, but how still old school, a.k.a. just fishing with your head up, still gets it done on places. Will we see forward-facing sonar dominate this classic, or will you see a lot of guys fishing because of the time of the year, the state of the water, the type of fishery? I feel like it's a good mix of both, but we did see forward-facing sonar win like Seminole and Okeechobee. So do you think... Is that going to factor in the game plan of keeping that honest of whatever whatever you see there becomes a pattern, or is it going to be just uh, I'm going to develop a pattern and then utilize it when when it when it seems easy to to make it work? Man, I feel like I feel like you're going to see it play big time in this tournament as much as I don't want to want it to. You know, like I want to see an old school tournament. You go up there banging in the dirt, catching large mice, but uh, them small mouth are going to play, and you're going to. You're going to see guys do well with forward space and sonar in this. Kyle, you got anything for Matt before we let him go? I am I am good, man. Good luck, and I appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Uh, we, we were both looking forward big time to talking to you as, uh, as you yeah. just discussed being a big-time Tennessee River rat, and um, we certainly look for you to, to have some success, and good luck, man. I appreciate it, fellas. Matt Robertson on him fishing. We know him and uh, he's expecting that 17 pound a day, maybe a little bit more than that to be the winning weight. Matt, appreciate you having a, or, uh, joining Thanks, us. And we will, uh, we'll see you at the night of champions and we can't wait to see what we see at the night of champions. All right, buddy. <laughs> Matt Robertson, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I like, I like some of the things I heard from him there. Um, I feel Kyle and you might, correct me or agree with me i feel like matt holds back on some of his thoughtful answers because it would maybe make him emotional 
thinking about the classic, thinking about the importance. Like when you get funny guys in in a moment where they care about something, we see Gerald Swindle get upset. We see some of these guys get upset. Matt guards himself pretty well from getting upset, but I know what it would mean. It wouldn't be just wild and crazy 24 7, 365 if he won the classic. I think there'd be a lot of a lot of sentimental and a lot of accomplishment, you know, tears welling up in his eyes for for a kid from Kentucky to get it done, like he says. Yeah, no question. I mean, you can tell if you spend any time around him, you can tell how much it means to him. And just to be here doing this, and you know, that's kind of the point I brought up. But I mean, it really is crazy to see how his career has has just had this upward trajectory, you know, with with success so early on. Um, like I said, just from the jump, grabbing everybody's attention, but you can absolutely tell how much it means to him. Um, and I, I think you're exactly right. I, I definitely uh, agree with your point there. Yeah, I mean, we could it might be the first time somebody cries in a fur coat, but I think we could see that, you know. Um, but but I do like some of the things he also said about fishing. 17 pounds or so a day will get you about 51 pounds for three days. Uh, so he said 52, 53, somewhere in that 17 and change, which I fist pumped because my weight prediction on, on the fantasy site was 52, six. I think it's just a little bit, you know, what is that? That's a one, six over three days. That's about, you know, 17 and a quarter, 17, just under 17 and a half a day, um, equals 52 and change. So, I'm excited about that. And also some of the baits that he mentioned, he talked about square billing, flipping a jig, you know, jerk baiting, spinner baiting, stuff like that. I really think that this could be one, like, like he said, I don't, you know, forward facing center is always going to factor. Someone's going to find success with it, but whether the whole tournament is dominated by it or just spurts, I think there will be spurts where it'll definitely be what we see for everyone on camera. But I think, man, I think this is a body of water where you can turn your graphs off and go crank some rock or go chatter bait some pockets or, you know, you know, jerk bait a point, um, you know, with some current flowing by it. So I'm excited to see all of it factor, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what prevails and I'm not sure your thoughts on that either. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I actually agree with Matt in the sense that I hope that it's uh, like an old school, like, you know, up shallow grinders fest. I really hope that's, you know, we see some big large mouth get caught that way. And that's how, um, you know, some of the bigger bags get caught. I have no problem, obviously. I don't care, you know, for the most part how they catch them. But, you know, I have no problem with the smallmouth deal or the forward-facing sonar because you know it's going to play. Um, you know, if you look back to the 2021 tournament, the elite tournament, there was still a lot of jerkbait live scoping going on there. It wasn't necessarily obviously what won, uh, but we did see that play a decent bit uh, with a handful of competitors. So, um I think it's going to be a mixture of both, but I'm like you. I do hope that um, guys are able to go old school fish, you know, the bank, shallow cover, um, and, you know, catch some big largemouth. I think that would be really, really fun to watch. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, I might have caught my first fish on, you know, forward-facing sonar, live scope, panoptics, whatever you want to call it, the first gens of that technology. What was it, 2016, 20 you know, 2015 late in the year, maybe long time ago with, with a couple buddies, you know, and you go catch them. Uh, I think it was at Lake Hartwell was my first fish on forward facing sonar. And yet I don't feel like in 2019 that it was like all the rage or that we were talking about it a bunch. It was still something where, you know, there was only one brand that had it and the others just, it wasn't in their game plan. Then 2021 comes around and yes, it's in the game plan. Yes. Everybody probably had access to it, but it was so cold water wise, the weather was not conducive for it. Those fish were right on the bottom. I mean, even like so many people launched right where Gussie wanted and never saw those fish on their 2D or like you had to be looking for them for it. And so this is the third instance we've been there all during this time of forward facing sonar being available. But I, th it'll be interesting to see how it really is used. And I think that one thing that it'll help is every single event, we have two good days and a tough day for the classic. Uh, you see Chris Zaldane with 21-12 on day two, really tough day f three. You see Ott Defoe, 20 pounds on day one, 10 pounds on day two, a big bigger bag on day three. Everyone had a tough day, and it just was basically how how bad did your day suck was if you were in contention to win or not. And uh, I think four-facing sonar eliminates that tough day. I think that when it's not working up on the bank maybe for that style of pattern, 
that guys can go salvage their day with forward facing sonar on some fish that maybe aren't getting pressured. So that's my hope is that it kind of fills the void and we get a good consistent tournament, but we see a guy on the bank day one, you know, maybe forward facing to save the day on day two and back up on the bank on day three. I think that that's what it allows us to do on a body of water like this. Yeah. And, and, you know, going back to 2019, the best I can remember it, it, like you said, it really wasn't much of a factor at all because I want to say that was still during the time period that it was pan optics and live scope, like the real specific live scope deal maybe had just came out or it was like, you know, just starting to kind of round into form uh, to where guys were really utilizing. I don't really having a ton of success um, doing it, but then, you know, I think that, you know, guys, I think a big part of it also is just guys have gotten so much better with the technology, whether or not the technology existed then or not. I don't think that, you know, the, yeah, the elites and the pros had um, exploited its full potential, you know, if you will, uh, as to where now it's like, you know, we've seen it in the first two elite events. You really can't go anywhere and expect for it not to play. Like even in places you would expect there to be no forward facing sonar, it's still going to be a factor, you know, for somebody somewhere. I think, and what's funny is saying this now, I think in 2021 in practice for that elite at the Tennessee River, Tyler Rivette had a photo of Hank Cherry in his boat dialing in his settings on forward-facing sonar, and now fast forward, and he wins his first elite doing that. So somebody who was just dabbling or just figuring out how to work this computer up on the front of his boat is now you know a pro at it. So I, I'm interested to see that. Um, Kyle, let's get into it. Uh, we have another guest coming on in just a couple minutes. And but before we do that, let's get through our fantasy picks and then we'll uh, we'll have our guest on and, and kind of crunch some other kinds of numbers. But um, let's go with Rappel of Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing first. Uh, I'm basically sitting in mediocrity for both game modes. I'm in 54 percent for fantasy fishing and I'm sitting at 52 percent for drain the lake. It has been a dreadful start to the season for your boy. And uh, I'm looking to turn around in the classic. We got some more more things at stake. Um, and the buckets were rearranged. It does not matter about AOI, correct? Tell me how they were arranged and how you guys picked that this year. Because I'm normally a part yeah. of that, but I guess I just must have missed the I guess I must have missed you the missed call, the you know. You yeah, the cut lose. this year. <laughs> uh, they, no, you so leave the you did. leave the king out of the game plan. I just don't get it. But uh, Chase Sandson obviously... probably jumped in on it, whatever. This is obviously, um, you know, what we're going to talk about a little bit later, but we actually do a classics odds meeting. It's basically just to get together at uh, at uh, James Hall's house here in Birmingham. And uh, we kind of make the classic odds. And then from that, um, you know, and when I say that, like Brian Brasher obviously has a huge role in, in developing that for the website. But uh, we just kind of go through and like, who's your, you know, no question bucket A, a guys, bucket B, C, D and E. Um, and you know, obviously it gets tough to say at certain points, like what's, what's to justify a guy being bucket C versus bucket B. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, a little opinionated, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's the same buckets for everybody. So it's, uh, it's not like it's an unequal playing field, pretty much take the, uh, top contenders in a, and just work your way down from there. So that's pretty much how the buckets were determined. Yeah. And that's the one thing that you guys didn't necessarily do was put all the Canadians in the same bucket. Two of them are in bucket A, one of them is in bucket B, and I believe one of them is in bucket D. Yes, Cooper Glantz Cooper. in bucket D. So you got, yeah, you got two, one, and then skip C, and then another Canadian in D. So I know that the Canadians are happy they can pick three Canadians at least out of their five picks for for Rappel of Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing. Um, also, yeah, when you look at it, bucket E, it's it's always the opens and the nation and the team guys for the most part. But then there's always a trickle down of two or three elite guys. And you're like, man, for one, they're going to be mad when they see that. But then for two, that puts the fantasy fishing players at a big crossroads, because if they go with someone familiar, has a good track record, at least professionally, isn't too scared of the, the big moment, is not going to be a deer in the headlights that's going to be huge percentages possibly for a couple guys in that bucket for bucket E and, and yet someone from the nation, the team, the college or the opens, some a couple are going to make the top 25, you know, at least three or something like that. So if they come from bucket E, you're kind of risking it there. So let's get into our picks. Why don't you, you start us off 
with Rapala and give me your five picks, one in each bucket, and uh, and then we'll talk about them uh, before I give mine. So bucket A, it's it's always going to be the most tough bucket to pick from uh, without a question. And this classic bucket A is no different. Um, <laughs> the one thing you'll notice in a lot of my picks, they're fairly lower percentage. I really didn't do that unintentionally. I, these are just guys that I have a lot of confidence in and think will do really well. So um, bucket A, I got Stetson Blaylock. I've got Stetson Blaylock, two uh, third place finishes in his previous two classics. Uh, it's something you and I talked about in the preview show before the season started. Uh, I think that Stetson Blaylock is a good pick in A. Bucket B, um, once again, with a lower percentage, I couldn't believe Patrick Walters in bucket B was at 7.1%. Um, so I'm going Patrick Walters with the potential of, like we mentioned, Ford facing sonar playing, uh, jerk bait. I mean, all the things that, you know, could be in play. Walters um, obviously has a lot of success doing uh, bucket C, I got Keith Combs, another guy. You look at bucket C and you're like, wow, I know it's loaded with good, good guys, but um, bucket C for Combs to be 3.7%. I mean, you're talking about a guy that has all this momentum built up to to win on the last event of the season, get in. Um, obviously, two made two cuts back to back to start the Elite Series season. Uh, Keith Combs could be a real player in bucket C. Uh, bucket D, I got Clifford Perch. Um, actually surprising that once again, the lower percentage, because Perch has had more success on average in the last, you know, in the two previous tournaments than anybody, um, in the field. I mean, had a good event in the classic in 2019 and 2021, I want to say finished somewhere in the teens. I've got it in my story here, but, um, moving along, uh, bucket E on the hopes that the forward facing sonar is going to be the deal. I got Cody Huff in bucket E. So, that will round out my lineup. I'll, I'll run through them one more time. We've got Stetson Blaylock in A, Patrick Walters in B, Keith Combs in C, Clifford Perch in D, and Cody Huff in Bucket E. I like that, and I, I kind of can see some of the chalk by people who know fishing, which I'm not, I'm going to claim that I know fishing, but I even though the percentages didn't match, I kind of expected some of those picks to happen. Um, I matched you on one of the five picks and my percentages were kind of across the board as well. 3%, 6%, 12%, 8% and 0.7%. So I went with Stetson Blaylock in bucket A as well. I really feel if we want to play that shallow, dirty water, square bill, jerk bait, lipless, spinner bait, bladed jig type deal, Stetson Blaylock's prepared for that. I think also if you want to go back to the forward-facing sonar game, I think that he's well-equipped to do that too. He fishes in Arkansas. We kind of got cold, dirty river types that also have clean water in them and sections like that, and and I don't think anything is going to necessarily phase him for that. Um, my bucket B pick is Lee Livesey, 6%. I think, man, he shows up in some of those big events. Didn't pan out for him on the final day at Hartwell, but I think – you know, it's hard to pick closers when all these guys have the ability to win. But Lee livesey has got four wins in like the past three seasons. Um, and I think that I th- think that this is this is one of those ones that that he could be in his wheelhouse the whole time uh, as much as you can be not in the state of Texas. Uh, bucket C, I, I went with our guests today and uh, not Brian Brasher. I went with Matt Robertson and Bucket C, 12%. I do think it really sets up well for him. I was thinking about Keith Combs. He's going to be on my team later. Uh, there's some other good names in there. I know Scott Martin was is supposed to be a fan favorite just because of his following. He's only at 9%. Jacob Poroznik, what a great angler there. Brian Schmidt, uh, a lot of those guys do really well in um, grassy lakes. No grass here to be found, but still. I mean, Scott Canterbury had a couple of giants the last time we were here uh, on camera one of the days did not make the final day, but was still on camera. Um, thing that shocked me, did we mislabel this thing on fantasy fishing and say that the classic was back at Hartwell? Cause how the heck That's is Brandon Cobb at 39%. I love you, Cobb. Uh, <laughs> he, a shameless plug. He was last week's tackle tip Tuesday, but how in the heck is Brandon Cobb at 39% kind of, I, I kind of like, Watch him win 
And I'm going to feel dumb as a box of rocks because I didn't even consider. So I'm so very confused about that, that I kind of just was like, you know, maybe I don't know why it's not even like your team was still set from Seminole, like, or Okeechobee, like it resets. So I don't, I don't understand. That's what I said. I've been saying that all week. I'm glad you're the one that brought it up. So I don't have to be the bad guy, but literally I could not, I could not figure that out. I literally said the same thing to chase Sansomir. I said, like, what am I missing? Like, I understand that Brandon Cobb is one of the better versatile anglers everywhere we go. So I'll like put that out there to start with. That's absolutely fact. But to be that much higher than the rest of the field, I was like, what are we going off of? Like, I'm just, I, like you said, I'm sitting there wondering if I missed something here. But, I mean, he yeah, got, I'll he let got, you finish. I'm sorry, I thought the same thing though. He got 22nd here in, in 2021 for the elite. Good finish. I mean, for sure. It's going to be totally different. Uh, not totally different. It's going to be significantly different. Um, I don't know. That's an interesting one. I hope the fans are right. I mean, Cobb's a great guy. Yeah, Not the biggest, sure. biggest bass of the classic last year on his home length, though. Um, I don't know. Bucket D, I'm going with Will Davis Jr. Um, man, I've been impressed. We got to talk to him before the season started, but I've really been impressed with his fishing on the water. Uh, did his deal at Okeechobee, maximized a small population of fish to be able to do and get a top 15 there. And then we saw him obviously be the day one leader at Seminole. I have a have a solid finish there for Will. This is now going to be a dirty water, dirtier water, current driven fishery. What other ones are nearby? I think maybe the Coosa River. <laughs> I think that uh, he's used to the current flow. I think he's used to fishing in this conditions. And um, yeah, I don't I don't care that it's a different body of water. I feel like that's he knows where that sweet spot's going to be on this point, even though he's never fished this point, he's going to, it's going to be a quicker connection for him. Interested to see how he does. Um, The only thing that's better for him is that he's had two elites under his, his belt this year. He's not like one of the nation guys that's just coming in fresh off the, off of an open or just qualifying and and fishing the classic thrown into the fire. So Will Davis jr. And bucket D for me. And then uh, bucket E man, I looked at Carl, I looked at LeHue, I looked at Huff. Those are the three elites. And then uh, Chad Pipkin sees those are the four elites in Bucket E. Tristan McCormick, two-time classic qualifier now from the Opens and the College Series. Thought about that for a second. The percentages do not outweigh the benefits, in my opinion. And I'm taking, you know, it's one of those dartboards. You got all the pretty colors that are worth all the different values, and you're trying to hit a certain one. I'm going to throw a dart at one JT Tompkins. I've been really impressed with him coming so close in the opens, piecing it together, not put, not piecing it together, what he's learned. I know at you fall open to start the open season, didn't have the best finish, stayed after and learned it so that he could be better going forward. I think that's he's set up for success based on his family dynamic, his dad's support, his younger brothers nearby. I think that's his younger brother, the three of them fishing the opens together. Um, I really, really like JT Tompkins. And uh, at 0.7%, it looks like why, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, six guys out of um, six, 10, 11, 12, 11, six guys out of 11 have less than 1%. So it's a crap shoot on picking which one's going to do well, but I think JT is going to do well out of those. So uh, my five are Blaylock, Livesey, Robertson, Will Davis Jr. and JT Tompkins. Winning weight, 52 pounds, 6 ounces. We'll see how that fares out. But, um, yeah, overall, any any thoughts about your picks, any more justification or any any response to my picks? Because I, I feel like it is – it's hard to predict. Your guys could finish 26th and 27th, and that's a solid finish for fantasy, but they missed the final day cut, you know? Yeah. No, it, it, I felt like it was very tough. I actually had this conversation a few times here in the office that – I feel like in past classics, you can look, and this is not always the case, but it seems like at least in recent history, you can look and be like, oh, that's a like can't miss guy. There's like your other can't miss guy. There's a can't miss guy. It's like you could make a justification for basically anybody in any bucket as to why they would do well. And I, you know, like I said, it's always like that to an extent, because if you qualify for the classic, like you earned your right to be there, obviously. But um, no, it was very difficult to pick. Um I'm definitely not going to go back and change any, but 
every time I look at the the rosters, I'm I keep continually thinking, man, I really would like this guy in this bucket, but I, I uh, I'm gonna stick strong with it and uh, stick with what I got. Yeah, and I think that you know, just like you could pick an any number of eight or ten guys, a different combination to do well for maybe your drain the lake team, you know that those are all people that you could put a winning team together. Like this is the eight guys I think that have a shot to win. Cause we talked about it a couple of weeks ago that yeah, there's 55 in there and there's a one in 55 shot and Brasher can maybe break down exactly the odds to win in his opinion, how he, how he categorized that. But uh, it's not really a one in 55 shot. It is, but the odds that someone from a level, not the elites wins is dramatically lower. You know, you can almost rule most of that out. Um, and then of the elite qualifiers of the 42 that make it, you could probably rule half of them out. So then you come down to it and there's about 15 to 20 guys. And depending after day one, you can rule half of them out. So it's really like a, a tournament that suits eight to 10 guys. And that's, what's crazy that Swindle or Hackney, uh, Christie before last year, hadn't won a classic yet. Cause they're most times are going to be one of those eight to 10 guys that we think, or Polinick hadn't won a classic. I think because he keeps winning elites. We're not bothered by it or AOIs, but like at a certain point, Pollock's gonna have to win a classic. Um, I'm gonna just I'm gonna trash him until he wins one. No, I'm just kidding. But I think that you know it's a hard tournament to win um, because it's not an even playing field on on who has a shot, in my opinion. Um, let's get into drain the lake and figure out our eight man teams um, and who we picked that we won't be able to pick the rest of the year. So, Kyle, give me your first. Let's... Give me your first four. And I'll give you my first four, and then we'll I'll flip it, and I'll do my last four before you do your last four. And I feel like this is where it gets tough too, because you know, naturally with the the triple points for the winner, you want to pick the winner of the classic. That's that's a no brainer. You want to pick it for a drain the lake, but at the same point, it's like like you said, you want to save some of the guys. You got to be stealthy about who you save when you save them. Uh, but I, I think. You know, we talked about your Lake Seminole team being like your loaded roster, like guys that were really going to play out that, you know, obviously didn't. Um, I think that's kind of how my roster looks this time. Like it's pretty well loaded. So to start with, right off the bat in your top four, I got Gerald Swindle, Chris Zaldane, Brandon Lester, and Clifford Perch. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and duplicate. I also have Swindle. I did pick Keith Combs and Lee Livesey, so Livesey matches my my fantasy team. And then Brandon Card, um, despite all that Brandon Card's been through, what a great start to a season top five. And really, it might say Salisbury, North Carolina under his name, but, uh, I mean, I've stayed at his house before uh, out of necessity coming through Knoxville, and he lived within five minutes of a boat ramp on Fort Loudon. So if there's anyone who actually – there are guys who have East Tennessee success or live in East Tennessee – but this body of water is different from Cherokee and Douglas, different from Chickamauga, Watts Bar, um, Nickajack. You know, it's different than Tim's Ford. It's different than Kentucky Lake. There's something different about this place. And him having some knowledge and actually coming through with a top 10 in 2021, um, I I really expect him to not be necessarily nervous, um, but I expect some butterflies. It's his hometown. He would love to do well here. And so, um, yeah, Combs. Livesey, Swindle, Brandon Card. That's my first four. My last four are some guys that I think, honestly, most of these guys are fishing pretty well as of last year or they're, they have been streaky over the last couple years of, of really good success. I got Kenta Kamira. I think that if it's a moving bait bite, um, he's proven his track record with some swim baits, some crank baits, bladed jigs some baits that I don't even know what category we're going to put them in because they're a mixture of all of them. I asked him about it, and he said, oh, how'd you see that? And I said, you posted it. And he said, I need to take that down. So um, Kenta is one of the guys on my last four. David Mullins as well. Brock Mosley and Mark Frazier. Um, we always want to go big name, superstar for the classic. But I don't think anybody was picking Hank Cherry in 2020. I don't think anybody picked Tank Cherry to back to back unless they were a fan in 2021. It's more times than not, it's necessary. It's not necessarily the biggest star that gets it done. There's there's a hometown vibe like the last classic here. There's a 
uh, revenge on a body of water, that kind of thing plays. And so I think some of those quieter guys that are under the radar, could it be David Mullen's time? Uh, he's been close in AOI the last couple of years and had something happen. Um, he's been close to winning places like Champlain and have something happen. Um, Mark Frazier, man, just been rock solid since he's gotten here. And then Brock Mosley, I mean, he's had success on this body of water in the last event we had here. I think if there's going to be a schedule with an event that looks like Mississippi, I think the part of the Fort Loudon probably looks like Mississippi, you know. For sure. Um, to round out my final four, I have also have Brandon Card, uh, Matt Robertson, David Mullins, and I'm going Tristan McCormick. I think uh, the possibility, like you mentioned earlier when we were talking about Rapala, Bassmaster fantasy fishing. Um, you know, he's not going to be stunned by the bright lights anymore. And I'm not saying, you know, there's always a bad chance or a good chance you can have a bad event or a good event. It's just bass fishing. But, um, you know, to have experienced it just a year ago, I think will bode well for him. And, uh, you know, it seems like when we had Tristan on, uh, you know, the end of last year, he seemed to be really, really excited about getting to fish, um, you know, at the Tennessee River and, uh, it sounded like he was going to put in some some real time to uh, try to learn it even better. So so I'm going Tristan McCormick. That'd be my dark horse for uh, Drain the Lake. That's awesome. Say your last score again because we matched on like two or three of them, I think. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Card, Matt Robertson, David Mullins, and Tristan McCormick. Okay. So we did David Mullins and Brandon Card, and then I had Robertson on, on Rapala. Um, Kyle, I'm going to pitch this to you. Me and Such were talking about this in the office the other day. and of the nation guys. So we've seen nation guys duplicate success and make it multiple times, you know, Taylor Smith in the past, uh, Jeff Luger, Paul Mueller, um, some of the West coast guys, they definitely knock it out a couple times in a row. These are all three new guys. Uh, Will Diffenbach, Will Davis Jr. And um, Jonathan Dietz. If one of them had to take on the role of Brian Kirchel and win from the nation, since that's the only time that's ever happened, what say you? Is it the guy who's on the elites that has now experience at the pro level, or do you think a Dietz or a Diffenbach could surprise some folks and make a name for himself in the biggest stage? Uh, it's hard to say because I, I I like all three of them, uh, but I'm going to go Jonathan Dietz. Um, I'm going to say you know getting to watch him there at the uh, you know the nation championship last year on Pickwick, um, getting a feel for him fishing other events. Uh, I definitely think he's one of those guys that's going to go so low under the radar. You know, I mean, I feel like for the nation guy to have that success and have a chance to make a run at it, I feel like he has to be so under the radar that he's getting overlooked by everybody. Um, and I feel like, you know, that would be the case with Dietz. And um, like I said, seeing some of his success in other events uh, to this point in his career, I certainly, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if it happened. Of course, let's, you know, when you're talking about a nation guy winning, you'd be surprised if any of them did to an extent, but you know, it wouldn't be a complete and utter shock, I guess is what I mean. Yeah. And then, and then when you think about it, a couple of the other people that made the classic from other levels, Colin Smith from the team, Casey Smith from the opens, Lewis May from college, you had McCormick, like you mentioned from, from the opens Dietz and Diffenbach from the nation. Um, but some of the other people that made it are currently on the elites, you know, Cooper Gallant made it from the opens, but he made the elites as well. Will Davis jr. Same thing. Um, so some of these guys have gotten a little bit of a trial run through some higher level, you know, Keith Combs, Kenta Kamira, they both won opens last year to be able to make it to the classic as well. Kenta double qualified and did that deal. So be interesting to see one of those. We had a smaller percentage of anglers that um, occupy those open spots that weren't elites, you know, normally it's, and I'd say with the EQ and uh, that focus, I, I don't know if we have a single elite win in open this year. You know, I think we could have nine opens anglers make the classic for 2024 at Grand Lake. So we'll see. Um, Kyle, so our next guest on the Inside Bassmaster podcast brought to you by uh, Black Rifle Coffee Company is none other than Brian Brasher. And you may not know his name, um, but he has been a longtime writer and reporter for outdoor sports and then also has been with Bassmaster for quite a while. What he does day to day directly is Bass Times Magazine, and I think is he involved with Bassmaster Magazine as well? Both publications. 
both publications for sure. He writes a column in every Bassmaster magazine, um, as well as, you know, is the editor, chief editor of, of Bass Times as well. He's an avid angler, an avid Alabama sports fan. And for Brasher, if you've ever looked on Bassmaster.com in January or the leading right up to the classic, and it's the classic odds. Who's got the best odds to win the classic? And normally it starts with defending champ and it has an AOY. Those are the top two. And then maybe some locals, some guys, whatever. Um, if you've ever looked at the number and said three to one, how in the heck did he come up with three to one? You're not alone. I've done the same thing and I work with Brasher. And I was like, how are we getting these numbers? I mean, where is there any kind of bias? Is it all statistics? Is it gut? Is it the time of year fishery what what factors in well kyle today he's our second guest of the podcast and we get to ask him that because i also we we kind of broached this subject in the last episode there are some anglers who probably came in with lower odds that have caught their tail to, to start the elite season and needed to maybe get updated because they're one of the hottest couple anglers in the sport to kick off 2023 so kyle uh, I'm excited that Brasher is going to be our guest and be able to explain, I guess, the rationale to the madness. And Ronnie, let's let's go ahead and bring him in. We got the editor of Bass Times, Brian Brasher, um, the man behind the madness of the Classic Odds Gallery. Every year gains a ton of traction, a ton of uh, you know views on Bassmaster.com because people love it. The only people that don't love it so much sometimes are the anglers, Brian. And uh, I know that's one of the the parts of the the gallery you don't care that much for. Yeah, let's say I'm the name before the madness. I, I don't want to be the man behind the madness. It, it's my name on it, but uh, this is this is something that comes from a meeting of the minds, as as you well know. But I, I do start researching it uh, usually in late December when the the field is set and. Uh, then you know the process from there. We try to have a meeting in January where we all get together and we have some pizza and some beverages and um, come out of it with the bones for the odds gallery. And then I put it together and then the chaos begins. So Brian, is there like a is there like a range that you try to never get too far away from? Like the longest odds person in the classic, is it always going to be within? 300 to one. And then the, you never have a favorite that's more than two to one, you know, like it, what's the, what's the range there, or is it just based on their straight stats and skills and I guess newness to the sport or, or veteran of the sport? I think 150 to one is as high as we go. And I, I mean, I don't want to just slap somebody in the face and say 3000 to one or a million to one. You know, we used to do a, have a, a fun little tournament at my dad's company every year. And believe it or not, they did an odd sheet on that. <laughs> and there would be one team that always said, you know, only if you drain the lake. And then it, the <laughs> next team would say, not even if you drain the lake. So, so we, we don't want to insult anybody. But, but you know, if you're a guy who's, who's coming from the team championship or coming from the college series, and you have no idea what you're about to experience for Classic Week, your odds are pretty long. I mean, I, I think I said introducing this year's gallery, the longer the odds, the better the story. So I mean, sure. they, they, really nobody should worry about any number that they see except for that one, whether it's three to one or a hundred to one. I mean, that one says you have a chance. The three of us, we're, we're not winning it. We got zero. But the, anybody with, with a one in front of their name, behind their name with the, the odds gallery, they've got a shot. So, uh, you know, uh, some people haven't seen it that way through the years. And I, I have heard some some kickback, but that's okay. Brian, you know, we talked about it a little bit there to start with uh, about the process of coming up with these odds. You know, one thing you mentioned in the odds gallery this year is it's really not a whole lot different from, uh, you know, creating these fantasy fishing stories and pundit picks and columns and things of that nature. Um, just talk to us a little bit, if you would, about the the things that you try to consider. I know there's a lot of different considerations, a lot of different factors that go into it, but just the major categories that you try to, you know, assess to make these odds? Well, when I first sit down and start doing research in late December, I, I consider how many classics has a guy been to? Uh, how well has he done in those classics? Uh, what kind of history does he have on the venue uh, that we're going to? And then uh, momentum. I like to look at the last five or six tournaments. If a guy bombed his last four or five last year, you don't know where his head is coming into this year. 
Uh, if he finished on a big roll, um, as somebody like a Jeff Gustafson did last year, uh, then maybe you do know where his head is. And then we've sort of adopted the, the practice of running it twice. Uh, we run it one time with odds that are solely based on last year. And then we update it a little bit. You know, a, a guy like Tyler Rivet started this year at, I think, 50 to 1. And now he's up to 20 to 1 because he's got off to one of the hottest starts in the League Series history. So I, I got to think that he's coming in with a little bit of confidence. A guy like Will Davis uh, was a nation qualifier. Nation qualifiers, I, I believe with all my heart that a nation qualifier will win the Classic again someday. But since it's only happened once in 52 years, the odds of it happening are pretty long. So he he was 100 to 1. He went to 50 to 1 after to going to uh, Okeechobee and Seminole and having pretty a uh, couple of pretty good tournaments. So it, it changes. It's fluid. If I looked now, I could probably come up with reasons to change four or five more anglers. But uh, it, in the end, it's just talking points. It's all for fun. And, and we'll, we'll be wrong. We know it. We, we always are. So uh, no shame in that. Well, Brasher, that's what I wanted to ask you about. You know, like the last couple, I mean, I'm assuming Jason Christie's odds in the last year's Classic, he was one of the best odds guys, just with his story there at Hartwell being the angler yeah. he is. And I looked back at the 2020 Classic odds and the 2021 because Hank Cherry had never won an elite event. He won the all-star event, you know, the, the small field event in 2013. He won Rookie of the Year. He almost won some Classics. But other than that, he didn't really have any wins since the first year and a half of his career. And and he was seven to one odds in 2020 at Gunnersville wins the classic. Then you bump him up to six to one odds at Ray Roberts, even though it's different time of the year, but he is the defending champ. Those are really good odds. And uh and he came through and won. What is since you've been doing this, you know, what is the longest odds that has ended up winning? Like someone do you recollect, you know, someone you I've put been, at 25 to one and, and they ended up winning it? I've been doing it for seven years now. And the longest odds to win it were 15 to 1 with uh, Jordan Lee at uh, Lake Hartwell. Um, was it 2018? Yeah, to go back and, to back, yeah. And and believe it or not, uh, when he won the year before that, uh, his odds, I want to say, were 7 to 1, 8 to 1. I actually dropped him the next year because winning back-to-backs had been so rare at the time. Um, Hank, his odds, the year that he won it, uh, 2020 at Gunnersville, it was that hidden factor, gut feeling. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, that counts for something too, the old gambler's gut feeling. And uh, so I, I gave him pretty good odds. He came through and then I bumped him up for the next year because he was a defending classic champion. And that wasn't as scary a thing as it had been when Jordan was defending classic champion. So all this thought process going on and, and it means absolutely nothing, but it, but it is fun. It's, cool. it's fun every year. I think I think it's very interesting. Let, let's just say, I mean, if Jason Christie won this, uh, you know, this week at, at Tennessee River, only one angler hasn't gone back to back since 2017. That would right. be absolutely phenomenal, like, or absolutely mind blowing that that's only happened then. And Kyle talk about it. Kyle and I talk about it all the time. There's 55 anglers, and technically, all of them have a 55 to one shot or whatever. Like, it's everybody's got the same amount of shot, but then we actually break it down and you think about you know the nation opens college team their shots not equal to jason christie's shot jason christie's shots not equal to half the elite guys that qualify and then when you break it down it ends up being a 12 man you can make a 12 man list that actually have better odds than other people like it's not actually as even and fair as people think well i just have to beat 54 guys no it's we, we hardly see it come from this section of people. And so I know that that has to come into play for you as well, but also the playing field, you know, Tennessee rivers, uh, an interesting playing field. And so how did that factor in with, did you assume the weather would be cold or warm or dirty water or clean water? Did you take any of the actual fishing into account? I don't think you can make assumptions like that. If you start on uh, prep for it in December or January, and you're trying to predict what the weather is going to be like in East Tennessee in late March, <laughs> man, you're really shooting for the stars there. I, I, I think experience on the venue, success on the venue means more than you know, what kind of fishing do I expect? What, what, what do I expect the fish to be doing? We, we just don't know. And this was a really tough one because I think there are a handful of anglers in this tournament who've been to this, uh, this venue twice. Nine. Nobody's been to it more than that. 
So, and, and a lot of the, the high profile anglers who've been there once finished 75th or lower. So it was, it, you really had to kind of factor that out. And I, I guess where it did factor in was a guy like Gussie who, who got a win there, a guy like Hackney who got a top 10 there. That, that really plays big in, in the mindset this year. And and I can uh, I can attest to what Brian is saying there because uh, before the 2021 classic we sat there in James Hall's living room and I argued with him for for hours basically about how it was going to be one deep one deep everything under the moon about how it's going to be in the summer it's going to be one deep and then the water comes up a hundred foot and everybody's flipping bushes I mean there's really no way to predict what nature has in store for the tournament but uh that's uh it looks as if this this time around uh maybe a little more stable conditions hopefully well and even right. kyle like you think about like brandon card you know it might say salisbury north carolina on his on his hometown now but he moved there for his wife's families nearby there but he had a house like i said was five minutes from a boat ramp at fort loudon for for years in knoxville and so he's got to be a favorite in my opinion and then now he's dealing with all these different conditions and situations and you're like how's it going to affect him well he's fifth in angler of the year so it hasn't affected him but it is the classic and there's so much going on and so um that also has to you know think in i guess the fans minds but since you made that in december you may have just you know relegated that to the back burner more than more than really thinking about who can who can catch him shallow who who can pitch who can flip who can crank you think about who is going to be best at navigating Night of Champions, um, Media Day, and all of this chaos that they have, all these these thousands of people at takeoff, and, and just all the hoopla that goes with the classic. And uh, it's, I, you know, I think certain guys approach this. I'm not going to name any names because I'm just guessing, but I think certain guys approach this kind of like a college bowl game. It's, it's they they've got a ten thousand dollar check before they get there. You know, they, they are a classic qualifier right now, no matter what happens. So how much are they really going to put into it? So it's just, it's so hard uh, to predict. I mean, and another thing I always point out early in the odds gallery is we're not trying to predict an order of finish. We're just giving odds for what each angler, his chance is theoretically of winning. And uh, if we were trying to pick an order of finish, man, I would, I would turn it in my notice and let you guys handle this forever. If you well, did Brian, nail that, though, I think that uh, Vegas would be calling and, and the sports oh, books yeah. would be like, hey, this yeah. Brian Brasher guy, you know, used to be around the Memphis area now in Birmingham. And he's he's the the swanee of bass fishing. If you yeah, I, that, I could but... probably probably get a, a better gig. Probably. Could. <laughs> what are you talking about? Our gigs, our gigs, the best, dude. Come on. I'm man. good with the gig. I'm good. <laughs> let's let's play the theoretical game here, Brian. You, you've made it crystal clear. Obviously, this is all for for fun. And that's exactly right. There's not going to be any wagering on any of this, of course. But if you had to give me two picks, I want a long shot pick that has the best, you know, your long shot pick, if you were betting on this, and then like a value pick, as you discussed before we got on the podcast. You give me a pick for both of those scenarios or categories. I think I said even at the odds gallery meeting back in January that for some reason it just feels like Stetson Blaylock's time. He's had some success at the Classic. I, I want to say seven pounds away from having two trophies, and, and one of those trophies he missed – by ounces and he, he's fishing well he seems to be even keel enough to handle the classic hoopla uh if he were to be into the lead going into the final day i don't see him freaking out as as some anglers have done in the past and you can see why it would be easy to do uh so from a gut feeling standpoint i, I think i've got him somewhere around seven to one uh so i i could see him being among my favorites now guys i've got ranked ahead of him like uh with with uh, shorter odds, uh, Brandon Palinick, Brandon Lester, hey, you'd have a hard time going wrong with any of those guys. But uh, yeah, man, Stetson is is one that I feel really good about going into this year. And then I, I always call that that money spot the twenty to twenty five to one. You know, you if you if you were placing cash wagers on this, which we've made it clear we're not. <laughs> um, you know that that that's a spot where it's not so long that it seems out of the question, but it is long enough that if you win, you're going to pay off pretty big. So uh, 
I, I moved Tyler Rivette up to 20 to one. I talked to him while he was practicing at Seminole. He sounds like a different Tyler Rivette. I mean, he just, the first time I ever talked to him, he's just this 23 year old kid who's following Hank Cherry around. And now he's his own dude. And, and, and maybe, maybe as good a crappie fisherman as I am. I don't know. I, I haven't been in the boat with him yet, so I can't say, but he sounds so confident. Uh, he, he's coming in off a great start. Um, so I would really keep an eye on him at 20 to one. That would be some good value. That's what's so difficult. And, and I don't, I don't uh, want to be in your shoes at all for doing odds, because if you think about it, everybody thinks about the biggest names in the sport, that those are on the short list of winners. But when you look back at it, you know, Roland Martin, uh, you know, Bill Dance, uh, then you have Aaron Martins, and and now currently you have Greg Hackney, Brandon Polinick, some of the biggest, Gerald Swindle, some of the biggest names of all time, this one title has eluded them. And it's not because they don't know the the week of preparation and the scenarios of night of champions media day balance and practice they know all of that this is just the hardest tournament in the world to fish i don't know if it's the three days where if you make a an error on one day it weighs much heavier than a four-day event i don't know what it is but a guy like brandon lester that does so well in the opens i, I don't want to be wrong but i think he makes a top 10 in like 65 percent of the opens he fishes like he's made Absolutely. a check in like 80 it's for three-day events Brandon Lester absolutely does well. Even two day events at Ufala, he was in the he was in the top ten. Um, so he excels at those three day events. Does that uh, factor in? Because I think about some of those guys who just do so well in the opens that this could be an opportunity for them to really shine. Because it is the three day format is just a little different. You still got to make it to the top twenty five to have a shot, and you can't really stumble because then you're too far away to win. So um, it is interesting how some of those top performing guys in the odds. Uh, are guys who've never won it, but they just have the ability to win it. Right. And it, it kind of depends on your st your distinction there with an opens angler. You know, you look back and opens qualifiers haven't had a whole lot of luck winning this tournament either. Uh, but if, you know, if you're taking a, you're taking a Brandon Lester and calling him an opens angler. Yeah. I'd say his chances are pretty <laughs> yeah. good. Take a Cooper Gallant, uh, who is, is yeah. He qualified through the opens, but we've already seen, uh, how he stands shoulder to shoulder with the elites. So I would feel pretty good about that pick as well. So yeah, they're, they're, they're well positioned. The, the opens, the competition, the opens is tougher than it's ever been. And if you can manage fish through a three day Bassmaster open, then chances are, you know how to do it for the classic as well, but uh, you're going to have to beat guys who are pretty good at every facet of the game. No doubt about it. Brian, I appreciate you joining us. Yeah, we were, we were talking about this and we were like, why don't we just have Brasher come on and kind of explain how he brackets some of those deals. And so if we were to put money on it, like he said, 25 to one's that sweet spot. Um, I do have one last question. I, I'm a numbers guy, but I don't understand when it's when it's two to one or three to one for Brandon Polinick. But then one of the galleries one year is three to two. Can you explain yeah. when that second number goes to two? Because I'm I've tried to wrap my head around it and I might it might be easier than I think, and I'm just I'm missing it. You know, I've always considered it kind of one of those hoity toity, well to do Vegas kind of things to make somebody three to two. Really what that is is one and a half to one. Okay. I mean it's as simple as that. And and why they list it like that. I have the, no the idea. favorite of all favorites. Yeah. 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 I think they just, they want to make it more obvious that this person is the favorite. I want to say I tinkered with the idea of giving Otto Defoe uh, three to two odds Ooh. the last time we were at Knoxville. And uh, I mean, he was one of the more clear favorites that I've had to pick through the years. So, but that, that's the only way I know to decipher that. Well, the sports books would not have, uh, or actually, the betters would not have won with that one, really. They, their payoff, they'd have to bet quite a bit just to That's make a right. little bit, you know. That's um, right. Yeah. Well, well, Brian, I appreciate you. I think the last time an opens qualifier for the classic won it was Randy Howe when he was on the elites, but had to win an open in 20, 2013 to make the Gunnersville Classic. Yeah, see, that, that see Chris, Bo Chris Bodes is like, hey, <laughs> we've had it happen. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. So, uh, Brasher, we appreciate you. Kyle, uh, I'm glad that we set this up, and uh, maybe we'll see. We'll have to take a look at the deal and have a report after the Classic on the odds. It's good to look back at the Hank Cherries and the Jason Christie's and the Jordan Lees and stuff to see how good their odds were and how 
right Brian Brasher was. So uh, for this episode of the Inside Bassmaster podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, we're signing off. It is classic week and we will crown a champion in less than one week's time. And hopefully next episode, we'll talk to the world champion in the sport of bass fishing.